nothing shall be impossible. He has all the power there is. Your need is nothing compared with the great things that God has done, and yet God pardons your sin and cleanses your spirit and gives you his nature just as easily as he makes the heaven and the earth, because God is God. God can deliver you from temper and pride and fear and hate and all other diseases of the soul, if you'll only trust him. Chapter 5 God's Immutability For I am the Lord, I change not. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6 Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17-18 through 18. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. James chapter 1, verse 17 Jesus Christ the same yesterday, and today, and forever. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. To announce that you're going to speak on the immutability of God is almost like putting up a sign saying, There'll be no service here tonight. Nobody wants to hear anybody talk about it, I suppose. But when it's explained, you'll find you've struck gold and diamonds, milk and honey. Now the word immutable, of course, is the negative of mutable, and mutable is from the Latin meaning subject to change. Mutation is a word we often use to mean a change in form, nature, or substance. Immutability, then, means not subject to change. I think we get a better idea of what we mean by mutable if we remember Percy Bysshe Shelley's little poem, The Cloud, that you may have learned in school. It starts out with a cloud talking, and it says, I am the daughter of earth and water, and the nursling of the sky. I pass through the pores of the ocean and shores. I change, but I cannot die. That's the way a cloud is. It's a cloud today, it's rain tomorrow, it's fog the next day. Then it's a cloud again, snow the next day, and ice the next day. It's boiling hot one day, but the next day it's cool. The next day it's vaporized and becomes a cloud again. It is constantly changing, passing through the pores of the ocean and shores. It changes because it's mutable, but it cannot die. Now there is in God no mutation possible. As it says in James, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Chapter 1, verse 17. There is no variation due to change. And there is also that verse in Malachi, I am the Lord Jehovah, I change not. Chapter 3, verse 6. They couldn't make it any plainer than that. There isn't one trace of poetry, no figure of speech, no metaphor. It's just as blunt and prosaic as for me to say, this is February 12th, 1961, period. There isn't any way to interpret that. You don't go to a scholar and say, what does this mean? You don't need to. I am Jehovah. I change not. Incidentally, he's the only one in the universe that can say that. And he did say it. He simply says that he never changes, that there is no change possible in God. God never differs from himself. If you get a hold of this, it can be to you an anchor in the storm, a hiding place in danger. There is no possibility of changing in God. And God never differs from himself. One of the sickest pains that we know in our lives is how people change. Men smile at you one day, and two weeks later they'll turn their face away. A friend you used to write to once a week you haven't written to in five years because a change has taken place. They've changed, you've changed, circumstances have changed. And little babies, they're tiny, soft things you can pick up, but give them a little while and they'll change. Their doting parents hold these tender little things in their arms, admiring and loving them until their love becomes a pain inside. 
They'll be startled, confused, and somewhat pleased one of these days to see that little fat body begin to lengthen out and those little dimpled knees becoming undimpled and getting bony. And that tendency to cling to Mama will disappear. The little guy will put his hands on his hips and back off. He is somebody now, and that's change. My wife and I take out pictures of the family every once in a while and just look at them. Such pretty little fellows they were, and so delightful. But they're great, long, lean fellows now, lanky, tall, and bronze, not the way they were. And that's not the worst. Give them forty years more, and they won't be as they are now. There is always change, change and decay in all we see. The English poet said, O oh Lord, my heart is sick, sick of this everlasting change and life runs tediously quick through its unresting race and varied range. Change finds no likeness to itself in thee, and wakes no echo in thy mute eternity. Only God does not change. And all things, as they change, proclaim the Lord eternally the same. That's a theological fact. That's something you can build on. That is revealed truth. It needs no support of poetry or reason. But once a truth has been declared and established, I like to reason it out. To quote Anselm, I do not seek to understand that I may believe, but I believe in order to understand. And so I'd like to show you, as briefly as I can, three reasons why God cannot change. That's reasoning within the Scriptures. Now, for God to alter or change at all, to be different from himself, one of three things has to take place. One, God must go from better to worse, or two, he must go from worse to better, or three, he must change from one kind of being to another. Now, that's so plain that anybody can follow it. There's nothing profound about that. Occasionally somebody will say, I preach over their head. All I can say is they must have their head awfully low. Isn't it reasonable to assume that if anything changes, it has to change from better to worse, from worse to better, or from one kind of thing to another? An apple on a tree changes from green to ripe. That's from worse to better. Now, if a little boy eats it when it's green, as I used to, he gets sick. I did it once or twice every year when I was a little chap on the farm, and I went to bed with a tummy ache. When it ripens, it has changed from worse to better, from our standpoint. But let it hang there long enough, and it'll change from better to worse. It will rot and fall away, and so it gets as worse from its better state as it had gotten better from its worse state. Anybody can understand that. If you can't, shake your head and see if you can wake up the brain cells in there. Therefore, if God is to change, then God either has to get better or worse or different. But God can't go from better to worse because God is a holy God. Because God is eternal holiness, he can never be any less holy than he is now. And, of course, he can never be any more holy than he is now, because he is perfect just as he is. There will never be a change in God. No change is necessary. Change is necessary in created things, but no change is necessary in God. Therefore, God does not change. And God, being the eternal holy God, cannot change. He will not go from better to worse. You cannot think of God being any less holy than he is now, any less righteous than he is now. And God must remain infinitely holy, fixed, forever unchanging in holiness. He cannot go from worse to better for the simple reason that God, being absolutely holy, cannot go beyond himself. He cannot get any more holy than he is now or go from less good to better. You and I, however, can. Thank God we can. He that is holy, let him be holy still, it says in Revelation chapter 22, verse 11. And I believe that since we are creatures and capable of mutation upward toward the image of God, we will become holier and wiser and better while the ages roll. But remember that in becoming holier and better and wiser, we will only be moving toward the perfect likeness of God who is already all wise and good and holy. God cannot become any better than he is. These words that you and I use, holier, wiser, better, we use about ourselves. A man is a good man, another man is a better man, but you cannot say better about God, because 
God is already the apex, the fountain, the top. There are no degrees in God. There are degrees in angels, I suppose. There are certainly degrees in people, too. But there are no degrees in God. That is why you cannot apply such words as greater to God. God is not greater. God is great. Greater is a word applied to creatures who are trying to be like God. But you cannot say that God is greater, because that would put God in a position where he is in competition with someone else who was great. God is simply God. You cannot say God is less, God is more, God is older, God is younger. You cannot say God is older because God has in his bosom all of time. Time casts no shadow on God and does not change God at all. God does not live according to the tick of the clock or the revolution of the earth around the sun. God does not observe seasons or days. He allows us to because we are caught in the stream of time. The sun that goes down at night and rises in the morning and the earth that goes around the sun in 365 days always tells us where we are in time, but not God. God remains eternally the same, absolutely the same. All the direction words that we apply to ourselves, back, down, up, and all such words, cannot apply to God. God can't go back because He's already there, being omnipresent. He can't go forward because He's already there. God can't go right or left because God is already everywhere. The heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain Him. Second Chronicles chapter 2, verse 6 So we do not say God came from or God goes to. We may use these words about God, but we don't mean them in the same way we mean them about ourselves. Direction words haven't anything to do with God. A week from next Monday, I'm going to get on an airplane and fly to Chicago, then get on another one and fly to Wichita. Then I'll get in an automobile and go to Newton, Kansas, wherever that is. I'll preach a while there in a Bible conference. I will be going somewhere, I will be there, and then I will be moving toward somewhere else. But God is not in one place moving toward another because God fills all places. And whether you're in India, Australia, South America, California, or anywhere around the world, or even in outer space, God's already there. If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. Psalm 139, verses 8 through 10. So these words, greater, lesser, back, forward, down, up, can't apply to God. God, the eternal God, remains unchanged and unchanging. That is, He is immutable. God cannot change from better to worse or from worse to better. There is, however, a third way to change. A creature can go from one kind of being to another. That beautiful butterfly that you squeal over in the springtime why, just a little while ago it was a miserable, hairy worm. You wouldn't have touched it, but now you say, isn't it beautiful? There was a change from one kind of creature to another. Moral changes can also take place. A good man can change and be a bad man, and then, thank God, a bad man can, by the grace of God, change and be a good man. We sometimes sing the songs of John Newton. Did you know John Newton was, by his own confession, one of the vilest men that ever lived? Did you know that John Bunyan, author of Pilgrim's Progress, was, by his own confession, one of the vilest men that ever lived? Did you know that the Apostle Paul was, by his own testimony, the chiefest of sinners? 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. But these men became saints of God. They changed. It's possible to change. There may have been a time in your life when you would have been bored to tears listening to all this talk about God, but you've changed. There's been mutation. Thank God you are not immutable. You are able to change. You changed from worse to better. You went from one kind of creature to another kind of creature. But you can't think that about God. God cannot do that. It's unthinkable. The perfect and the absolute and the infinite God cannot become anything else but what He is. 
In teaching the doctrine of the Incarnation, we do not say that God became man in the sense that God left his deity and took on humanity. Jesus Christ was both God and man, but his manhood and his godhood, while mysteriously fused, never passed over into each other. The old Athanasian Creed makes that very clear. It says that God became man not by the degradation of his godhood into man, but by the lifting up of his manhood into God. While Christ is God and was with the Father before the world was, when Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, he took a tabernacle on himself, but his deity didn't become humanity. His deity was joined to his humanity in one person forever. But God the Eternal and Uncreated can never become created. That which is not God cannot become God, and that which is God cannot become that which is not God. God can come and dwell intimately within his creatures, yet you do not become God when God comes into your nature and fills you with himself. And God does not become you. That is pantheism. God is your father and you're his child. He dwells in your heart, and experientially you are one. But actually and metaphysically you and God remain two beings. Buddhists teach that we pass away into nirvana, into the eternal sea of deity, and cease to be, like a drop of water into the ocean. I wouldn't look forward to that. If I were on my deathbed and some priest came and said, Well, Brother Toza, you're just about to pass on. Your personality will cease to be, and you will be lost and melted up into the vast personality that is God. I'd say, I'm not looking forward to it. I'm going to hang on to my own personality as long as I can, because I like my dreams and memories, my thoughts and worship, my happiness. I like to see and hear and feel. I like being human and alive. I like having my own personality. I could never look forward to being dissolved in God and forgotten. But I'll never be forgotten. God will always keep me an individual, capable of memory, imagination, thought, drawing conclusions, capable of worship. Always the same. God is always the same. As the poet Faber put it, Thine own self forever filling, With self-kindled flame in thyself art distilling, Unctions without name. Without worshipping of creatures, without veiling of thy features, God always the same. And when I say that God is the same always, I'm talking about all three persons of the Godhead. You will remember that the Athanasian Creed says, Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Spirit. The Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, and the Holy Spirit uncreated. The Father incomprehensible, the Son incomprehensible, and the Holy Spirit incomprehensible the Father Eternal, the Son Eternal, and the Holy Spirit Eternal. Yet there are not three Eternals, but one Eternal, as also there are not three uncreated, nor three incomprehensible, but one uncreated, and one incomprehensible. You can run through the gamut of the attributes of God, and what you say about the Father you can say about the Son without modification. What you say about the Father and the Son, you can say about the Spirit without modification, for there is one substance that are together to be worshipped and glorified. So when we say God is the same, we are saying that Jesus Christ is the same and the Holy Spirit is the same. All that God ever was, God still is. All that God was and is, God will ever be. If you remember that, it will help you in the hour of trial. It will help you at the time of death, in the resurrection, and in the world to come. To know that all that God ever was, God still is. All that God was and is, God ever will be. His nature and attributes are eternally unchanging. I have preached about the uncreated selfhood of God. I'll never have to change or edit it in any way. I go back over some of my old sermons and articles, and I wonder why I wrote them like that. I could improve them now, but I can't improve on the statement that God is always the same. He is self-sufficient, self-existent, eternal, omnipresent, and immutable. There would be no reason to change that, because God changes not. His nature, his attributes, are eternally unchanging. Whatever God felt about anything, he still feels. 
Whatever he thought about anyone, he still thinks. Whatever he approved, he still approves. Whatever he condemned, he still condemns. Today we have what they call the relativity of morals. Well, you can't be too tough on people, they say. After all, right and wrong are relative terms. What's right in Timbuktu may be wrong in New York, and what's wrong in New York may be entirely right in Buenos Aires. But remember this. God never changes. Holiness and righteousness are conformity to the will of God, and the will of God never changes for moral creatures. God intends that moral creatures should always be like Him, righteous, holy, pure, true, always, forever and ever. However, God sometimes winked at sin in ancient days, Acts chapter 17, verse 30, because men were ignorant and the plan of salvation was not yet revealed. God also puts up with some things in us today because we're still children and don't know and can't yet grasp His eternal purposes for us. He's not excusing it. He's simply patiently putting up with us until we come around to the truth. But God always hates sin. If you want to know what God is like, read the story of Jesus Christ. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. John chapter 14, verse 9. So that however Jesus felt about anything, God feels the same. When Jesus picked a baby up and put his hands on its head to bless it, that's the way God feels about babies. But when they brought their children to him, the disciples said, Take those kids away. This is a theological school, don't you know? We are busy talking theology. Get those babies away. But the Lord said, Suffer, little children, and forbid them not to come unto me. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 19, verse 14. In the city of Chicago, there was a Sunday school among Italian immigrants. One little girl had memorized this verse. She lived on the streets, and her language wasn't the best. One Sunday they asked her to quote the passage she learned the Sunday before, and she said, Let the little kids come to me, and don't you tell them they can't because they belongs to me. She had it all right, even if she didn't have the King James Version. The Lord loves little ones like that. He still does. And he still thinks the same of the penitent harlot that he always did. He still thinks the same of the tender-hearted man seeking eternal life. He did not, does not, and cannot change. We're in the middle of a world that's changing all the time, and I for one am glad it's changing. I'm glad the weather changes, aren't you? We're glad when the weather report says it's going to warm up a bit, unless it's August, and then we don't want to hear it. In the world of nature, I hardly need mention how a seed produces a plant, a plant produces a flower, a flower produces a seed, and so on through the eternal cycle. Things are changing. God allows things to change in order that He might establish that which cannot change. The book of Hebrews has this for its thesis. The altar changed from the temporary altar to the eternal altar. The priesthood changed from the temporary priesthood of Aaron to the eternal priesthood of Christ. The tabernacle changed from the temporary tabernacle in Jerusalem to the eternal tabernacle in the heavens. The blood sacrifice changed from the blood that was shed repeatedly to the blood that was shed once for all and does not need to be repeated. Things changed until they perfected themselves, and then they changed no more. And all things, as they change, proclaim the Lord eternally the same. Now what does all this mean to you and me? It means that my poor, helpless, dependent self finds a home in God. God is our home. I look forward not so much to heaven as my home, but as God is my home, in His heaven and the eternity of God. We poor victims of the passing moment, we have found the timeless one. When I preach, I notice some people looking at their wristwatch. We're victims of time, counting our pulse beating, tearing off from the calendar the page that tells us that one more month has gone by. But there is one who contains time in his bosom, the timeless one who stepped out of eternity into time, in the womb of the Virgin Mary, who died and rose and lives at the right hand of God for us. He invites us into his bosom where time is no more, and instead of getting old we stay young in Jesus Christ. Do you know that song, Now rest, my long-divided heart, fixed on this blissful center, rest? What did he mean? 
If a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Mark chapter 3, verse 25, said our Lord. There is confusion, revolution, and tumult until we find rest in Christ. What is that blissful center? It is none other than the Son of God made flesh, crucified, and risen. And he invites us to rest in his bosom. There is a real sense in which nobody knows rest of mind or heart until they find it in Jesus Christ our Lord. God has made us for himself, and we find not rest till we find it in thee, said Augustine. An old song we used to sing says, Come, sinners, to the living one. He's just the same Jesus as when he raised the widow's son, the very same Jesus. Come, feast upon the living bread. He's just the same Jesus as when the multitudes he fed, the very same Jesus. Come, tell him all your griefs and fears, he's just the same Jesus, as when he shed those loving tears, the very same Jesus. Calm midst the waves of trouble be, he's just the same Jesus, as when he calmed the raging sea, the very same Jesus. And you'll find him yesterday and today and forever the same. He has not receded into history past. He is the same today as before he went away. He's the same Jesus Christ the Lord. And if you turn to him now, as Mary turned to him, as the rich young ruler turned to him, as Jairus and many others turned to him, he will fill you. He's not visible to our sight, but, Lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. If you turn to him for clearer light, you'll find he is the same Jesus as when he gave the blind their sight, the very same Jesus. He'll feed you as he fed the multitude. He'll calm you as he calmed the sea. He'll bless you as he blessed the children. He'll forgive you as he forgave the woman that fell at his feet in her shame. He'll give you eternal life as he gave eternal life to his people. He'll wash you as he washed their feet back there. He's the same. The God we preach is the same God, unchanging and unchangeable, forever and ever. I recommend to you Jesus Christ, the unchanging one. I recommend to you God's answer to your questions, God's solution to your problems, God's life for your dying soul, God's cleansing for your sin-cursed spirit, God's rest for your restless mind, and God's resurrection for your dying body. For your advocate above, I recommend him to you. You will find him to be all he ever was, the very same Jesus. Chapter 6 God's Omniscience His understanding is infinite. Psalm 147, verse 5 Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. These texts say that God's understanding is limitless, that his knowledge is perfect, and that there isn't a creature anywhere in the universe that isn't plainly visible to his sight. Nothing is shut before the eyes of God. That is what is called divine omniscience, one of the attributes of God. An attribute, as I have said before, is something which God has declared to be true about himself. God has declared by divine revelation that he is omniscient, that he knows everything. The human mind staggers under this truth when we consider how much there is to know and how little we know. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, for example, that if a man were to start reading the books in the British Library on the day he was born— and read day and night for seventy years without taking time to eat or sleep, he would only be able to read a small section of the books in that collection. Even those who know so very much know so very little. Dr. Samuel Johnson, the great English lexicographer, was known as the most learned man in England. When he was compiling the first English dictionary, he defined a hock, the middle joint on a horse's rear leg, as a horse's knee the middle joint on a horse's front leg. Some time afterward, at a party somewhere, a society lady turned to the great doctor and thought she would get a rise out of him. She said, Dr. Johnson, why did you define a hawk as a horse's knee? He said, Ignorance, madam, sheer ignorance. 
He was the most learned man in all England, but he admitted that he was ignorant on some things. Will Rogers said, Everybody is ignorant, only a...